Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Real Vision Daily Briefing. It's Monday, January 4th at 4 p.m., just after market close here in New York. I'm joined by Mike Green of Logica Capital today. Before I talk with Mike, let's kick it over to Haley for today's stories. Hey, Max. Happy New Year. Investors are gearing up for a turbocharged 2021. Want evidence? Just look at the price of Bitcoin. Only a few weeks ago, it smashed through that 20,000 mark. This weekend, it soared above 30,000 for the first time ever. After setting a new record above 34,000 on Sunday, just yesterday, prices dropped sharply to around 27,000 before recovering to around 31,000 on Monday. But after closing out 2020 with gains of more than 300%, a growing number of traders searching for yield in a low interest rate environment are giving Bitcoin another look. This hunt for returns and unbridled optimism about the future isn't just powering Bitcoin's ascent. Investors are bringing that same energy into the 2021 capital markets. Today, we saw, however, stocks tumbled on the first trading day of the year. The Dow, S&P 500, and NASDAQ were all down because of this grim pandemic outlook with the spread of the new COVID-19 variants. Hospitalizations in the U.S. jumped to a record high on Sunday, and governments across Europe are extending lockdowns to try to slow the spread of the virus. Also, traders are jittery ahead of tomorrow's runoff elections in Georgia in the U.S., which could determine whether Democrats have control of Congress to push President-elect Joe Biden's agenda. Among individual stocks, if we look at it a little closer, Coca-Cola shares fell. The pandemic will, of course, continue to limit major public events in early 2021 and dining at restaurants, potentially hurting demand for products like Coca-Cola's beverages. Airline stocks, another group that has been hit hard by the pandemic, also fell. We saw American Airlines and Delta both losing more than 3%. Hotel operators also retreated. We saw losses with Hilton and Marriott. As investors broadly withdrew from stocks, we saw the VIX surge today to levels we haven't seen since June, of course, signaling caution. Overall, though, I think there will be three forces that should keep powering assets like stocks through 2021, at least, you know, the first two quarters, and that's the continued positive impact of stimulus, the distribution of COVID-19 vaccines, and the growing ease with which companies can raise capital on public markets like we saw with Airbnb and DoorDash just a few weeks ago. In short, the big trends that defined the end of 2020 when stocks reached record highs are expected to have some staying power, but we will keep that close eye on the VIX, especially today. Back to you, Max. Thanks, Haley. Mike, thank you so much for joining us on the Real Vision Daily Briefing today. Uh, It's great to be back, Max. All right. So you and I spoke uh, right before everybody sort of turned off for the holidays on December 17th, and that piece actually aired today. Uh, It wasn't exactly the most eventful holiday period for markets, unlike some recent holiday periods that we've had. But I think it's important to just uh, take assessment of anything that may have happened in that time that you think is important to update viewers on before we talk about today's action. So I, I think the only thing that really would catch anyone's attention is the extraordinary uh, uh, price appreciation of Bitcoin. And, you know, we've talked about that. That's obviously a favorite topic on Real Vision. Um, I think it's very interesting to watch and it reminds me very much. I mean, I've said this previously, that the environment that we are in is very end of 99, beginning of 2000 sort of framework. People have become extremely convinced of the idea that uh, balance sheet expansion or M1 growth or anything else is explaining the behavior that we're seeing. I remain skeptical of that, but it, it, that certainly seems to be the narrative that is broadly adopted at this point. Okay. So we, we won't focus too much on those big picture narratives in this interview. We're going to be a little bit more short, short-term focused. But um, you know, I said to, to me as, as a layman, somebody who's never sat in your shoes, that today was an interesting day. You asked me, why did you think today was interesting? And it led me to believe that that you didn't think today was uh, was all that interesting. And you even said you expected a sort of sell-off that we had. Why were you expecting a sell-off? And, and did you think that today was interesting at all? Well, I, I think the easiest... So, no, I don't think today was particularly interesting. I think by far the most important thing that happened broadly 
uh, is that people took profits, right? So they didn't want to pay taxes in 2020. They didn't want to realize those gains in 2020. And so a significant number of, of individuals or taxable uh, institutions likely took some profits today. And I would suggest that we saw that behavior. We started off the day positive, futures drifted higher. That's very common, you know, it's very common to occur. It's effectively a function of hedging activity that's occurring overseas. A significant quantity of short volatility that is being hedged by the dealer community where they've either sold calls um, and those positions naturally hedge into a higher delta as you've been pushed higher. I think that influenced the behavior of the futures. And then once you went live, the need to take some profits and take some risk off probably dominated. And I would suggest that we saw that broadly across assets, whether that was Bitcoin or whether that was oil or um, various forms of energy, some of the metals. It, today was definitely one of those days that you look at even the soft commodities that remained positive, things like corn, have some pretty interesting you know, potential reversal tops, right? A, a pretty aggressive uh, spike upwards followed by reversal. So it's going to be interesting to see how this plays out. Okay. And does this sort of profit taking, usually is it a one day affair or is this something that takes place over the course of a week, a few weeks to start the year when you have so many assets in the green from the previous year? So when you say um, typical, I don't think anything coming out of 2020 could be viewed as typical. And so I do think it's important to distinguish. But if you go back and you look at the transition from 99 to 2000, for example, you saw a very, very similar dynamic where profits that had been generated and accrued in the late stages of 1999, people held on uncomfortable with their risk levels into early 2000, took some profits in the first couple of days. And there's certainly no guarantee that this is going to play out in the same way. But having taken those profits, they then found themselves trying to add back to their positions, right, to buy back into either related names or into other names that they might find attractive and launch the process that basically carried us through March of 2000. OK. And so with that being said, what are you expecting over the course of, of the, let's just keep it at this week? What are the sorts of things you'd be watching for? And then, you know, what are the maybe points that could tell you that you need to be looking somewhere else? So our the quick answer is, is I don't trade on weekly timeframes. <laughs> so yeah. like I, I don't know what's going to happen over the next week, but um, my expectation is, is that sometime over the next couple of days, inclusive of today, is ultimately going to be a buying opportunity as we head into what I think is going to be a more uh, substantial correction uh, occurring later in the towards the end of this first quarter. That would that would be my bias. I think there's a number of factors that are influencing markets. I think people tended to get a little bit too excited about the reflation narrative. I, th I know a number of investors um, are starting to begin to talk about the the dynamics of um, some regulatory changes that were embedded in the Secure Act that influence the dynamics of 401ks and the contribution, particularly from small businesses, effectively f facilitating um, multi-employer multi plans for small businesses that makes it very attractive to uh, generate fairly significant withholdings um, into 2021. I think those are likely going to become significant players, but I do think the rollout and implementation of that is going to take a couple of days at minimum before the money starts flowing in. And so okay. in the presence of that, taking some profits, creating those conditions, um, I think that was to be expected. The challenge that we continue to have is, is that the markets are increasingly inelastic. People hear me use that word, and it just simply means you generate more of an increase in dollar value than money actually comes into the market, right? So if you think about it in a VC term, there's a pre-money valuation and a post-money valuation. You add dollars to the valuation, theoretically, the dollars that came in are the only thing that has influenced the value of the business. It's very similar in a stock market, right? If you in, if you insert in another dollar, theoretically, the value of the stock market should go up by a dollar. But because of inelasticity and frictions in the process of doing that, your inability to find somebody who's willing to sell you that incremental dollar, which is enhanced by the dynamics of passive that people have heard me talk about until they're probably sick of it, that sort of phenomenon creates a market that is increasingly inelastic. And I, my expectation is those who took profits today are going to be surprised at how hard it is to get their positions back in this market. Is it quantifiable? Like each dollar in is $2 up or $3 up? Is is there a multiplier effect that you can quantify this to or does it differ from time period to time period? 
So I, I believe that that number is changeable. There's actually some interesting academic research that came out last year. You've heard me refer to the work of Gebe and Koijin. Um, Gebe is at Harvard and Koijin is at uh, University of Chicago. They have something they call the inelastic market hypothesis. And their assessment is, is that that number is around five, right? So $5 of market value created for each dollar that goes into the markets. My assessment is, is that that's um, both overly simplistic because it captures a period of time. And I think that elasticity changes. Um, and the second thing that I would suggest is, is that it varies by investors, which they allude to specifically in the, the abstract of their paper. They identify that a significant component of financial market fluctuations is a function of different types of investors. And those who have you know, followed my work know that I think that passive investors are incredibly inflexible in their behaviors. And as a result, they should generate higher inelasticity. My work suggests that their inelasticity is multiples of, or the impact of a dollar flowing into passive is multiples of a dollar flowing into active. Okay. Be because of their price and sensitivity. So say right. somebody like who, who likes to buy distressed assets, this effect will be less pronounced because they're already buying when the, when the sellers are available. And so that- Correct. And, and we, we hear this all the time and we know this is true, right? When funds go out and raise a bunch of money for distressed debt, it becomes very difficult to buy distressed debt because as they try to deploy the capital that they've raised, the prices go up, right? And so inevitably, you you end up with a chasing phenomenon where they decide, um, well, a dollar higher, two dollars higher, five dollars higher is no longer that you know that expensive in the context of all the prices going up, right? So it turns into a relative value game very quickly. We're familiar with that within the macro space. We tend not to think about it too much as it relates to stock markets, right? Because the, the the whole theory of something like the efficient market hypothesis is that markets are highly elastic. In other words, a dollar in has almost no impact whatsoever on the value of the market in total. That those theories are are almost laughably dismissible at this point. Okay. Well, some of what you said seems to be relatively bullish in the short term, as you think that these these flows will continue, and clearly the inelasticity should should push us higher. But you used a phrase, a more sizable, or I, I might be you know misrepresenting your words, but you said uh, that that you expect to see some sort of of pullback or correction in the first quarter. What does that pullback or correction look like for you? And what are the sort of indicators that you are going to be watching for for trying to figure out when it may actually occur? Well, for me personally, um, as you know, I've been on a keto diet, so I'm thinking like 255 can go to 240 is the pullback that I'm hoping for. Um, that's in the first quarter. Most of it will be probably towards the end. But on a, on a more markets oriented observation, I would suggest that there are a number of factors that begin to play in this first quarter. One of those um, is the dynamics of tax, right? And so um, my sense or expectation is is that there are many investors who are relatively new to the markets who participated through quote unquote free option trading and are not necessarily aware that options are treated as ordinary income in turn or short-term gains right and so the withholdings that will be required for the gains against options are significantly greater than the holdings that would be required under a normal condition. There's also many investors who have opened their first accounts. And as a result, I just wouldn't expect them to have done this. This was a feature from 2000. If you go back and you, you search the newspapers, you'll read lots of stories about employees in the dot-com space or those who made a ton of money on options suddenly discovering that they had bought a house but forgotten to withhold enough, to keep enough money to the side to pay taxes on it, right? Yeah. Um, on, on the sale of the options. I, I, I would suggest that we're we have a fairly significant risk of that. The second thing is that our friends, the required minimum distributions return this year for the first time since 2018. And so the dynamics of uh, the Trump tax cuts eliminated those for 2019 and 2020. They now return for the first time in 2021. And so this first quarter should see an element of required uh, dis uh, distributions from the retirement accounts of those who are now turning 72. So people will be caught offside by their tax bills and then we'll have required mis minimum distributions returning. Is there anything else that you think structurally could be setting us up for, for a sort of correction? I think that there is a tremendous amount of speculation in a number of assets that, again, I think people have adopted a narrative. And it'll be interesting to see how they react to the need to sell. 
right? The, that same inelasticity that works to the top side, that when a dollar comes in, causes markets to rise dramatically, right? And you can almost rank markets by their inelasticity. Things like Bitcoin are off the charts. Things like passive investments in the United States are probably somewhere in between. And active managers who take in money and don't necessarily have to deploy it at all are going to be at the lower end of the scale, right? If money is coming out of assets in order to pay taxes, that money is effectively flowing into the government coffers, that same inelasticity can turn around and, and fly back in your face. And prices could correct quite sharply. Okay, so quite sharply. So you think that this would be more of a, a March style correction, or I mean, we had some mini corrections here and there, but they were they were pretty rapid um, over the course of 2020. Is that is that the the new normal to to steal a popular phrase? I think the new normal is markets that have a uh, disproportionate drift to the top side and extreme inelasticity to the downside. In other words, corrections happen with a speed and ferocity that we are not historically used to. I, I continue to think that March 2020 is not the outlier event. Okay. All right. Well, we haven't really touched on anything beyond the equity markets. Is there anything cross-asset that you are, are focused on, commodities, bonds, uh, that you think is, is important for investors to pay attention to, even if they are just equity investors? So I think it's premature to know. I do think that there is um, some really interesting price behavior around assets like the soft commodities or many of the hard commodities. They've been on a tremendous run. Those who listen to uh, my uh, December uh, outlook uh, are aware that I think that those are mostly tied to supply disruptions. I see very little evidence of excess demand. Um, that could be wrong, but I, you know, I think the the broad narrative that people have attached to it, this idea that prices are going to take off and run to the right, uh, on the idea that you know Fed printer goes burr and oh isn't this obvious and simple, I, I could very well be overthinking this, but the the reality is is that um, even the sort of dramatic price increases that we have seen in things like lumber, where lumber prices have you know roughly tripled over the past uh, uh, year. The impact that that has on a home package, for example, so Lennar, I think, just came out with some data on this. Their observation was that the impact of the, the increase in lumber prices had taken the lumber set for their typical home from 35000 to 70000 right? Now, that's a huge increase. That's a dramatic increase, but it's not as much as raw lumber itself. Among other things, that highlights the value-added component. When you're cutting lumber to lengths, you're dealing with specific components. The generic lumber contract doesn't capture that. And so as a result, it shows greater price volatility, right? The price of corn has gone from 300 to 485 as of the close today, right? The impact that that has on a box of frosted flakes is zero, right? It's roughly two cents. Um, and so the impact, like when you think about that, that Lennar announcement, you're now talking about the average new house cost going somewhere from 350,000 to 370,000 because Lennar is going to eat some of that in their margin. They're not going to be able to pass 100% of that through. That increase in price is going to reduce the demand somewhat. The demand for housing is not perfectly inelastic. If prices go up, it will result in reductions in demand. And so you're actually setting up the conditions with higher prices that both stimulate additional supply and reduce the demand. And that, that tends to be where these things work out. I mean, I, I continue to highlight for people that Exactly this sort of activity happened in early 2018. Exactly this sort of activity happened off of the recovery from February 2016, the early, um, the, the early dynamics there. And prices corrected quite sharply to the downside. I, I continue to have as my base case that there's going to be some significant challenges to the reflation narrative. Okay. And you, you compare this time to other periods in the market. Is there a specific market period that this you know most reminds you of at this this point in time? Well, I, I mean, look, I, I think one of the hardest things to um to, to ever do is to say something like, you know, it's different this time, um, or it's the same this time, right? There's so many variables that are being changed in that equation. I had a, uh, a Twitter debate with, um, not really even a debate, um, with um, uh, a gentleman uh, this past weekend about the idea of valuations. He highlighted that valuations were higher because 
interest rates were 6% in 2000, and therefore today with interest rates at 0% or 1%, if I go out to a longer date, which is probably more comparable for a longer duration asset, that you know that, that, that means that valuation should be much, much higher, right? The problem is, is that that's, that's compressing things down to a single variable. Right. So, you know, in the simplest valuation models, you have a level of cash flows, you have a level of growth, you have a level of interest rates. And so if you hold the level of cash flows constant, if you hold the level the forecasted cash flows, if you hold the level of growth rates constant, if you hold the equity risk premium constant and you reduce interest rates, well, yes, the output is it's going to give you higher valuations. But that's absurd to hold everything constant. Right. So if we have low interest rates because we have low expectations of future growth which is certainly what's embedded in the forward curve in interest rates, you shouldn't have much higher multiples. In many cases, you could actually argue you should have lower multiples. Um, the sort of uh, supply disruptions and political pressures that could emerge under something like Georgia, flipping to the Democrats and moving to a $15 minimum wage and, and universal basic income or anything else you want to pick, higher corporate tax rates, you know, those dynamics have to be factored in as well. And, and again, it just kind of reinforces for me that the narrative that valuation is somehow driving this market is not really true. Okay. Well, you, you brought up uh, Georgia and, and a big known unknown that we have that will be, you know, cleared up in the next few days or, or weeks. Uh, is there anything that you're focused on in terms of the Georgia runoff and, and will the results impact your outlook in any material way? Well, I think a couple of interesting things happened there. One is is that you know President Trump has um, managed to put himself into exactly the position that I was worried about, where his actions to hold on to the White House have now potentially violated laws and placed him um, at risk of prosecution. I think that would be a terrible outcome for the United States. I understand what has happened. Um, I wrote this on on you know Twitter yesterday, I believe it was, that at the end of the day, Trump is increasingly powerless, and I think that we are um, seeing a, a tremendous amount of manipulation of data by what I would argue are largely political opportunists who are trying to lock in a subset of the population, right? We tend not to think in those terms, but if you can get 5% or 10% of the population become fanatically loyal to you because you were the person who stepped in to defend the individual that they had chosen to represent them or who they thought stood for their fears in the political system, that becomes a very powerful base of operations, right? And signaling disloyalty to that group or signaling loyalty to that group can meaningfully affect your fundraising capability, your primary support, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I do think that we're seeing very cynical manipulation of people in this process. The Second thing, though, is I, I tend to think that people have misinterpreted Georgia as a low probability event or the flip to Democrats as a low probability event because they're saying there's two seats. The Democrats would need to win both. Um, therefore, it's 50-50 um, for each of the two. So there's only a 25 percent probability of them winning. So it's it's extremely unlikely that people would split ballots in that framework. Right. So if you're going to vote for Kelly Loeffler, you are certainly not going to vote for a Democrat as your second uh, yeah. choice in Senate, right? And as a result, I think the probabilities are much greater that you end up actually with Democrats. You're beginning to see that in the polling. I, many people assign uh, today's price action to those sorts of polls and that awareness. Doesn't explain what happened in futures, which to me um, would have begun to reflect that because the polls were available much earlier. We knew several hours before the markets opened that this dynamic was increasingly in play. And I would also point to the fact that the markets began the process of recovering towards the end of the day to suggest that that's really not what's happening. Again, I don't think we're pricing in fundamental features. I think people are much more um, reacting to the fact that they came into the year with excess risk, that they had held that because they wanted to avoid paying taxes in 2020. And now as we look at 2021, they attempted to do some of that. And it's going to be interesting to see if they have the ability to get back into markets in a, in a you know, attractive pricing or better prices than they exited. I, I'm skeptical. OK, well, should the Democrats actually take both seats? Is there anything important that that would change in your framework? I'm not really convinced that that it changes meaningfully. Right. So, yes, you do have. Um, the dynamics of tribalism, and you do have the Democrats who have an incredible incentive to stick together. And with a vice president as the tiebreaker, uh, 
you know, you put yourself into a situation where it would be unlikely that they would meaningfully deviate. Um, it still is quite difficult to get very aggressive legislation across. There is the Democratic Party, to me, seems like a very unstable coalition of an extremely progressive, almost militantly progressive group. Um, and what is largely represented by this administration, which is, hey, let's just go back to the standards that we had before, right? It's the Biden administration to me is inherently conservative. And the idea that they are going to fully embrace the principles of unlimited fiscal support and making everybody wealthy and, and you know, stepping forward in that framework to free everyone to pursue their aspirations and, of course, buy stocks in the process, yes. I'm very skeptical about it. Okay. Well, is there anything that we missed today in terms of how you're thinking about starting off the year in the short term that, that we think is important for, for viewers to hear? So I think the only other thing that I would just highlight is, and it goes back to some of these points, I do think that today's price action in the dollar is probably just an extension of some of the observations that I made in the equity markets, that the trend that had begun has momentarily reversed itself. I think we have to be very cautious um, about thinking about the idea that the dollar is worthless. At, at the end of the day, things are very different than they were at the start of 2020. As the U.S. starts to come back line, online in terms of its production, as much of the demand, you heard me talk about this on December 17th when we recorded the year look ahead, we've pulled forward much of those imported capital goods demands, whether that's in the consumer producer durable, the consumer durable space or in the producer durable space, the dynamics of PPP encouraged money to be spent uh, in uh, 2020. Um, I think it's going to be. I think it's going to be interesting to see if that continues. The the actions that the Trump administration has announced, and that it seems that there will be incentive for the Biden administration to continue in terms of checking some of China's dynamics, um, are I, I think here to stay. And it's going to make it more challenging for that regime. At the same time, their currency has appreciated so dramatically over the past 12 months that everything they sell is increasingly bringing in, you know, it's coming at a higher price to the American public. And so in the absence of significant income supports, it, it, it strikes me that we could actually begin to see a um, deterioration of that trade deficit or an improvement in the trade deficit as it relates to the U.S. and a loss of capital flowing into China. And the last thing I would just say is I'm acutely focused on the dynamics of China. I think that China is displaying extraordinary vulnerability. And I, I tweeted out um, uh, the other day that China is leading us out of the Great Depression in the same way that Germany and Japan did. And I think that's really important for people to remember. If you go and you look at that time period, the narrative was that the rest of the world had solved these problems, that the authoritarian regimes in Italy and Germany and Japan um, and the Soviet Union had solved the problem, right? Uh, an article came out, I think, in the last 24 hours or 36 hours that was highlighting that many Chinese employees have not been paid for eight months by state institutions. Those are irreconcilable. That is telling you there is a Potemkin village that is being constructed and really what you have I had a good conversation with a friend of mine who described China as a nation of 1.4 billion hostages. I realize how inflammatory that is, but that is what happens when you have that size population and you're able to withhold just a little bit from each one, it can create tremendous resources. And I, I think we're seeing that. I think they are far less flush than they would like to present to us. Any comments on Jack Ma's lack of appearance recently? Guy's so skinny, who would miss him? But um, no, it's I, listen, I think it's terrible. And I think, you know, we'll, we will ultimately see him make an appearance. Um, but the simple reality is, is that this is what happens to industrialists, wealthy individuals and industrialists in a state driven regime. You exist at the pleasure of the emperor. And when the emperor is displeased, you cease to exist. OK, well, we filmed an interview with you this morning and we booked a couple of interviews for later in the month. Why don't we just do a bit of a tease of what you talked about earlier today and what we can expect from you and, and Rohan Gray and then Josh Wolf making his return to Real Vision. Yeah, um, I'm, excited. I, I'm excited about all of those, although um, my guess is my popularity on Real Vision will begin to plummet as I start to bring some of these on. So 
the discussion this morning was with um, a gentleman associated with uh, the Panda uh, movement out of South Africa, which is um, the Pandemic Analytics and Data Initiative. It is focused on the ideas of how to disaggregate the uh, very real existence of this pandemic and the need to appropriately address the health risks associated with it. With what I have made very clear is my view that we have handled it terribly from a political side. And we have, as a population in the developed world, far too easily handed over our freedoms in exchange for a small measure of safety. Um, the discussion with the Panda guys, I think, is going to be eye-opening for people to understand. And I encourage people to listen with an open mind. My objective is not to engage in, in epidemic denial or anything else, but instead to make sure that people are aware of what they are seeing in terms of the data. And I do think that's a, a general broad theme that we are reliant on um, bureaucracies to produce data in a period of extraordinary flux and uncertainty like we had in 2020. Much of the data that we are used to receiving is going to be um, relatively poor quality. Uh, Rohan Gray is an individual who I was drawn to by his appearance on another podcast. Um, Rohan is a controversial figure. He's a clear proponent of MMT, a professor at Williamette University. Um, my discussions with Rohan, I think Rohan has some very interesting ideas about stable coins and the dynamics of them. And to me, stable coins fit into a class of Silicon Valley activity that has largely been dominant for the past several years, which is, you know, move fast and break things, right? So effectively, these are unlicensed banking arrangements without the protections associated with traditional and licensed banks. They are doing exactly the Uber move, which is unlicensed taxis. And if we get it big enough and the demand is high enough, then they will be forced to accede to it. I think it's going to be very interesting because I, I tend to fall into the camp that says the government is going to treat the banking system and the monetary system as quite different than they did the taxis and the lodging for Airbnb or the media and communications platforms for Twitter and uh, YouTube, et cetera. I think there's a, a much greater wariness. We're beginning to see some of these dynamics around Tether, et cetera. And the last thing that I guess I would say on that is, is I think it's going to be very interesting to see how Tether plays out, right? I'm, others have pointed to the rapid price appreciation of Bitcoin as validation. I look at it in the context of Twitter, and I basically think what's happening is, or not Twitter, I'm sorry, Tether. I look at it and, and say, you know, my, my interpretation of these events is, is that the feds are closing in, you're shredding documents. Do you stop shredding documents or do you shred them more rapidly, right? I think you're shredding them more rapidly. Um, and then Josh Wolf, I think, is probably the only person in the VC and technology space that I could, I believe that we could turn to for an honest assessment of what's happened over the last year. And there's been an extraordinary amount of public market activity with special purpose acquisition companies going public. I actually encourage Josh to pursue this path. I view SPACs as something very, very different than what most do. Um, and of course, it ties into my views of passive. I think the um, what I'm looking to Josh for is a balanced perspective of some of the extraordinary gains that we've had in technology, particularly in things like medical science and um, the cohesion that we've been able to develop in terms of very quickly moving through stuff. There's some incredible advances in terms of protein folding that's coming out of places like Google, et cetera, that really have meaningful opportunity to advance technology quickly. But we also need to be very cognizant that there's an awful lot of showmanship that's going on right now. And Josh is probably the perfect person to, 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 to give us the perspective that allows us to balance those dynamics. Is he moving to Miami? Uh, to my knowledge, Josh is not moving to Miami, but um, uh, he, he has absolutely no objection to having a good time in Miami, having done that with him before. Okay. All right. Well, Mike, thank you so much for talking to us. Looking forward to, to all of those interviews and, and happy new year to you and yours. Thank you very much, Max. You too.